can tell us what nation agenda. What I'm going to suggest we do, actually, let's just do approval of agenda, then I'll do meeting protocol, and then we'll go from there. So can I have a motion to approve the agenda? If everybody puts their hands up, I can just pick at random then. Uh, Councillor Runge, Councillor Rudenberg, second. Any questions or comments? Okay, all in favor, thank you. Um, so let's, uh, we're gonna turn it right over to the UNBC crew. Uh, once I do that, please do take yourself off uh, the video and uh, press your mute button, make sure both of those are on. Because of that, I'm gonna suggest UNBC to the, uh, the, we go all the way through the presentation. It's just going to be too hard to manage with an interrogatory style. Uh, so let's go through the whole presentation and then we can open uh, for a conversation, have everybody back on screen uh, again once the presentation's done. Uh, my apologies to staff. I don't have a virtual backdrop as, as we've agreed to for our protocol. I realized that on this computer I'm using at home because I'm usually in the Fraser room. Uh, that uh, it doesn't have one. So I'll remedy that before Tuesday night's uh, council meeting. So with that, I will turn it over to UNBC to introduce who all the players are and then walk us through your presentation. Thanks so much, Mayor Simpson. Uh, I note in the agenda that uh, there was uh, some space for um, uh, Tanya to uh, say a few comments. Did you have anything you want to add before I uh, give a bit of an introduction, Tanya? No, I think your introduction uh, plays it out very well, Mark. You're, you're fine to go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, so I'll, I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm going to say uh, a relatively few things here and uh, leave the stage for our students to share what we've been doing over the last term. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mark Grew. I'm an associate professor here in the School of uh, Environmental Planning at UNBC. And uh, for the moment, I'm the acting chair of the school. Um, I thought I'd actually should start by sharing just a few updates uh, that are happening in the school while we're connecting today and then uh, use my time to really share uh, my gratitude and our gratitude on behalf of the school for being able to, to work in partnership with the city on uh, this uh, learning opportunity for our students. So uh, a bit of an update uh, of where we're coming from in the school uh, today uh, and over the next uh, little bit of time here. Uh, we're really, really excited to uh, announce that uh, we actually have two new faculty members uh, starting in uh, January uh, within the school uh, and including a uh, new chair of the School of Environmental Planning. And uh, we're really exceptionally excited about that growth. And um, over the last couple of years, uh, the school has actually uh, grown as a school that focus, focuses explicitly on the, the needs of planning for uh, northern and remote and rural communities. We've been able to grow uh, and actually double our uh, a cohort of students over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the reason I actually share those uh, successes from within the school is because I actually think that uh, they're the successes that we all share in. Um, one of the things we're really, really privileged and excited to be able to engage in in our teaching and learning in the school is uh, doing that often in uh, partnership, working with various community partners uh, across northern BC. So uh, much of the success we've had recently, I think, uh, is shared by all of our various community partners who are part of the teaching and learning that we do within the, the school. Uh, in this particular class, uh, ENPL 415 uh, Ecological Design, uh, we're really, really lucky to be able to uh, have partnered over the last four to five years with uh, community partners across northern uh, BC. Uh, we worked with the Aboriginal Housing Society here in Prince George, uh, the North Peace Seniors Housing Society in the past uh, up in the Peace region. And we were exceptionally excited when uh, we heard from uh, Lindsay, who was, was at the city at the time, about an opportunity for our students to uh, work with the city of Quinell. And uh, after uh, a little bit of time uh, with boots on the ground uh, with Lindsay earlier in the summer, it became uh, very obvious that the Caribou Field site presented uh, not only a tremendous future opportunity for the city, but a tremendous learning opportunity for our students and uh, the opportunity to have them work on a, a real world project uh, as, it, uh, were, as it was. Um, is uh, something that we can't create without the partnership and the uh, generosity and time of, uh, of folks like yourself. So I just want to make sure that I express my gratitude for uh, being able to uh, work in that kind of a, a model with our students. The last thing I'll say is uh, 
Before I pass over the floor to our student design team who will introduce themselves is just to note that what we focus on in this course is a relatively high level planning and design vision. Uh, so what you're going to see is a, a vision for the caribou field site. Um, and in the relatively short time that we have in a, a single term, we don't get to uh, get into some of the, the finer details in terms of financing and costing and, and engineering services for the site. So we're operating at a, a bit of a higher level in terms of a planning design vision, but uh, we hope that uh, we've uh, been able to put something together um, that uh, will be exciting for you guys to uh, take a look at and uh, have a little bit of conversation after our presentation from our student design team. So with that, uh, I think I will uh, leave no more uh, ado and pass the floor over to our uh, student design team. And uh, I believe I'll be starting with uh, Melissa, who is going to introduce the uh, team and uh, our presentation for today. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. I'll just wait for them to upload the presentation and then I will begin. Perfect. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are presenting on the traditional territory of the Clay Lake Tanae, and that we have participants joining us from the traditional territory of the Pataco Diné. Good evening, everyone. Our UNBC Environmental Planning Group consists of four members, Devin, Jacob, Pranesh, and myself, Melissa. We are third and fourth year environmental planning students taking Dr. Bruce's environment, Environmental Planning 415 Ecological Design course. Today, our goal is to present our final design concept, which we have created for a potential future development on the Caribou Field site located in Quinnell. Uh, welcome back to all the participants who were able to join us for the preliminary presentation back in November, and welcome to the new spaces joining us from the city and the community uh, who have taken the time today to connect with us. Here's just a brief overview of what we plan on discussing today. We will begin with a timeline that demonstrates the progress which we've made over the fall semester that's brought us to where we are today, as well as we will then go over a design process to give our new participants background information on the steps we've taken to analyze the caribou field site, and as well provide a refresher for those who have connected with us before. Once we've done that, we will then present our conceptual and final designs and explain the reasoning behind our methods. Finally, we will end with a question and comment portion, which we are more than happy to answer any questions and respond to comments about our project. Our timeline begins in September with our project's initial design and the outline for the expect expectations to create a guide for us uh, to create a success, success, sorry, uh, a successful end result. On October 10th, our team tra traveled to Quinault to visit the site in the surrounding area. And at this point, we were able to conduct research and understand the scale and the built form of the neighborhood area. Once we've completed that, we took the rest of October to study the site begin consultation period and create our initial design concept. In early November, we had our preliminary presentation where we presented our work, received valuable feedback that helped us formulate our final project. project. Uh, and since then, we've been working hard to create a final 3D design that works with the existing city policy, addresses community concerns regarding accessible housing, recreational amenities, and green space access. Here's a quick snapshot of some of the vital statistics of uh, Quinell's metropolitan area as a whole. Later, we'll break down these stats for our specific neighborhood. Uh, there's a distinct increase from 2011 census to the city's 2016 census with a, within the population, the median household income, and the median age. These three metrics are key in evaluating the city's uh, socioeconomic characteristics, uh, precisely the, one, the local population. A population increase of 4.7% shows a movement of the community and demonstrates a need for analysis of household demands, um, housing affordability, and various housing types. Uh, I will now pass uh, this along to Jacob, uh, who will talk about our design process. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'm going to start us off with uh, the location of the site. Um, the Caribou Field site is located in West Quinell on a 3.8 hectare field, which was the site of a former school. The site is surrounded by a variety of housing types and is near the Fraser River. The site is currently zoned as P-2, which is a public park and open space. 
though we hope to potentially change this zoning to RM-2, which is multi-unit residential medium density. Moving on to the design process. The design process serves as a roadmap to create an, a design that visually showcases our analysis and accomplishes the goal of meeting the needs of potential users. Each stage allows us to better understand the community and the site. The process is broken down to five main parts, starting with the design precedent. Design precedent allows us to step into the shoes of different members of the community and identify their personal needs and how they could be met with our site. This step allows us to gain a greater understanding of how to create the site, a site that benefits all types of people rather than planning from a top-down approach. We then moved to the public engagement where we met with community members and asked them questions about their interactions with the site and their opinions of what might work within their neighborhood. From this process, we improved our understanding of what the community needs from the site and how it will fit into Cornell as a whole. Next, we completed the site analysis, which is an in-depth look into the site and the surrounding area. More specifically, we examined an 800 meter walkable zone around the site. The analysis contains eight key factors, which are climate, microclimate, demographics, topography, green space access, morphology, policy, accessibility, and circulation. The analysis identifies opportunities and constraints within the neighborhood. Finally, we arrive at our two design steps. In these sections, we show our initial concept vision for the Caribou Field site, which includes aspects influenced from the precedent reports and citizen participation. Then we move into our final design that incorporates all our ideas into a three-day model. We will now further expand upon these, this five-step process. Design precedent. The purpose of design precedent is to think like a community member and articulate our community's goals. The exercise allows us to answer the following questions. What has worked elsewhere? Who are we building for? And how can we design for the community? We used two different precedent models. The first was, was a persona profile. Each of us created a persona that embodied a different type of person who requires a different set of needs. From a senior citizen to a young family to a young professional, we were able to cast a wide variety of needs to articulate a concept for our multi-generational housing. The next model we used was design precedent model where we looked at places nationally and internationally that might accommodate our personas. We found an example in Okotoks, Alberta, where developers are building an affordable community with an emphasis on carbon neutrality and sustainability. The developers also offered mixed housing types within the site. This idea was influential to our conceptual design. Now we're gonna look at our two personas here. Starting off with Betty. Betty is a young professional who is a recent university graduate who's moved to the North for a new career opportunity. She is looking for an affordable dwelling that encompasses elements of a sustainable lifestyle. She hopes to move to a place that provides public spaces for social connections and interactions with other young professionals. When we researched a dwelling that might accommodate Betty's needs, our minds went to Portland, Oregon where there is a housing project called Skinny Homes. Skinny Homes are homes built on a lower overall square footage with lesser width. This allows for the creation of more dwellings on site at a more affordable price point. The dwellings within the Portland site also encourage community gathering, which was another one of Betty's interests. Moving on to Greg. Our second precedent was created, who, sorry. Our second precedent that we created was Greg. Greg recently moved to Quinnell with his partner and his daughter. Greg and his family are looking for a three bedroom home that fits their budget. Their family only has one vehicle and they're looking for a home within walking distance of amenities. Greg also loves the outdoors and is looking for a place with easy access to green space. When we thought of a precedent for Greg, our, home, our minds went to the Homestead Project in Okotoks, which is a development on a 7.2 acre plot that includes a diverse range of dwellings with access to green space and day-to-day -day amenities. Moving on to public engagement. Due to the pandemic, we took a stakeholder engagement strategy. We met with community members over the phone and Zoom and learned about the history of West Quinnell and how some community members had previously interacted with our site. We had the privilege of talking to Anna Rankin 
from Community Housing, as well as Chris Coben from Capital Works and Infrastructure. We gained firsthand accounts of interactions with the site and learned how what those interactions looked like from accessing the baseball diamond to the former infrastructure of the tennis courts. We took three main points from these meetings, bring back recreational space, create a gathering space, create diverse and affordable housing. I'm now gonna pass off to my uh, colleague and friend Pranish, and he's gonna speak about our site analysis in more depth. Thanks, Jacob, and hello, everyone. As mentioned before, the site analysis contains the factors that aid in understanding of the site. It is based on the 800 meter walkable zone, which is created from the buffer made from the center point of the site, which includes all the amenities a person could easily walk into. Each section of the analysis is, is essential and provides unique information. Uh, we believe these five specific elements are the most important for creating an understanding of the site and how one might interact with it. These five, five elements are accessibility, morphology, green space access, circulation, and demographics. In this section, we completed an, an accessibility audit uh, which is a process where we grade the accessibility of, of the site based on a set parameters provided by Spinal Cord Injury BC. This audit indicates that the individuals with mobility issues have, may have difficulty assessing the amenities within the neighborhood and assessing the site in, the, in its current state. As displayed in the, in the map, uh, the areas with accessibility issues are marked with red and areas with good access are marked with green. Based on this audit, we learned that the site's current accessibility needs to be addressed in order to, in order for our design to accommodate everyone. Uh, the Gar Caribou Field site and the surrounding area offers a mix of housing types within a higher density area. Within a distance of 800 meters from the site, there are a great deal of amenities one can access. For example, the Waste Park Mall and a few small businesses and a variety of parks. On the slide, you can see the uh, proximity of the site to these amenities. Based on our green space analysis, the green, uh, the caribou field site has numerous surrounding green and open spaces. These spaces can be seen in the, as green on the map. And to gain a greater understanding of the quality of these green spaces, we also conducted a green space audit. Uh, this graph demonstrates the results of the green space audit, which was conducted by using the neighborhood green space tool developed by Gilder et al. Uh, the tool aims to characterize the neighborhood's green spaces quality by using a rating metric to score different attributes. Each team member had, a, had an opportunity to independently score the, each green space based on the questions and we then used an average score to determine final score for the green space in questions. There are five criteria, criteria to score on. There are access, uh, recreational facilities, amenities, natural features, and incivilities. There was a list of questions for each criteria. For example, how many access points are there in the green space? How many pieces of playing equipment are available? And if is the park litter, litter free or clean? Uh, the audit indicates that uh, all reviewed park have a similar overall score of 27%. However, there are some variations in the individual, individual domains. For example, both Webster and Ritchie Street Park performed well in the SX criteria, access criteria, which indicate that they are easily accessible in the neighborhood compared to uh, Corilio Secondary School. The Ritchie Street Park appeared cleaner and litter free than other two green spaces, and it scored slightly higher in the amenities criteria in contrast. Webster Park scored slightly higher in the recreational amenities criteria, meaning it has a sufficient amount of play equipment and open space. Uh, the Corillo Secondary School had the highest score in the recreational facilities due to the quality and availability of different usable recreational facilities in the area. In summary, uh, the data demonstrate that there are, there are opportunities for improvements in the recreational facilities, amenities, and natural, natural features criteria. Uh, the circulation analysis in, indicated that the transportation infrastructure only uh, supports automobiles and transits. Uh, the cycling and pedestrian infrastructure within the neighborhood was weaker in comparison and presented an opportunity to uh, opportunity for circulation improvements. In yellow, you can see the main access roads around the sites and the bus routes that serves the site in, in, the, uh, in the top right corner. This allowed us to plan for how people would be assessing the 
site and plan to accommodate people using all different forms of transportation. Next slide. The demographics of the site were found using the Stat Canada, specifically of the 2016 census. The site falls in the middle of two dissemination areas, as both were used to construct a neighborhood's demographic as a whole. The population of the neighborhood is for 1,450 people. Uh, youth 19 years and under represent 24% of the 24 percentage of the total population. The median household income of the neighborhood is approximately $47,000. However, a distinct difference between two discrimination areas regarding the median income as one, as one side was approximately $36,000 and there was $57,000. Housing construction was predominantly completed between 1965 and 80. And the majority of the housing types are either single detached or apartments. Now I will pass it on to Devin and Melissa to present the final design. All right, uh, hello everyone. Um, so now this will jump into the last step within our design process. Um, we'll just talk about here the conceptual uh, design and then how it morphed into the final design. Uh, so this is just a quick refresher of what our initial conceptual design looked like. Um, the preliminary design was a checkpoint in our final design process. It contained the critical features we wish to implement on the site and a template for where everything would fall into place. Uh, so this is the final design here. Uh, this is just an image top down view um, of our final proposal for a multi generational mixed housing type development that incorporates public green space and recreational facilities. After completing the preceding steps in the design process. Our group created this design uh, to set out, or sorry, that sets out to meet the potential future users' needs. Uh, so within the concept design, we decided to split the site into three rough sections. The first section is the part that contains the built form structures for residential use. The decision to locate the development on the side of the parcel was due to the slightly higher elevation compared to other parts and to provide users with easier access to and from the site with more existing pedestrian infrastructure, infrastructure implemented. The residential development contains a total of 109 units uh, with 18 being townhouses, uh, 27 row houses and 64 being apartment units. A total of 164 parking stalls are located within this development section uh, with the number of stalls being based off of the city Quinnell's uh, minimum required parking space policy. Uh, there was a concern brought up during our preliminary presentation regarding snow removal and storage. Uh, we have conducted an analysis here and there is plenty of room to store snow in the winter months as the total coverage accounting for development is approximately 16% of the total site. Uh, so the middle section of our site was designed with public green space in mind. Our initial concept provided much more public green space than what materialized in our final design. Uh, this, is, this was because uh, we had to account for more parking stalls for the apartment complex. However, this did not deter the addition of a paved trail network that provides users ease of access to all amenities on the site. The final section of the site design is the public recreational area. This contains various recreational uh, amenities to promote a healthy, active lifestyle. A community center, playground, three new tennis courts, and a public parking lot are all proposed features to draw residents from the neighborhood and encourage social connections. As well, currently on the Caribou Field site, there is a full-size baseball diamond on the site. Uh, our team intended to preserve this feature um, moving into the final design process here. Um, the reasoning behind this decision um, to move it from its current place to the southeastern portion of the site uh, is because that roughly 40% of the site falls below the potential 100 year flood line. Um, and in the extreme case of a flood, uh, there's little impact on the residential development uh, with the majority of the damage being done to the low impact green space adjacent to Rolf Street. Uh, the residential development on site contains various forms of housing. Our goal was to create densification all while creating more of a community rather than a singular structure. The housing located on the parcel's western section is planned to be three-story row houses that back onto a private gathering space. These three bed, three bath units are planned with a small private fence front yard while having a patio on the back leading to the communal green space. 
The total square footage of each of the 27 three-story row houses is approximately 1,800 square feet. We anticipate that these market units will be targeted to families as the three bedrooms allow a growing family uh, plenty of room to move about. Uh, the first floor of the proposed row houses will consist of approximately 600 square feet of ground level living space. Uh, this floor will contain the main living family rooms, uh, the kitchen, the first bathroom, and a dining room. Uh, each unit will also get two parking stalls located to the immediate front of the property. The second floor of the row houses will again consist of approximately 16, or 600 square feet sorry, uh, of living space. The makeup of this floor will consist of one bedroom, an office, bathroom, laundry storage space, and a potential rec family room. And finally, the third floor consists of the same square footage as the first two floors and contains the master bedroom ensuite with walk-in closet, uh, the third bedroom, and a bathroom. The housing for the northern and western sections of the site is planned for townhouses that are two stories high. The appeal of having some lower density housing with a ground level entrance is to appeal to seniors and people with limited mobility who rely on accessible and adaptive housing for their needs. These three bedroom, two bath units are planned to have a private fenced in yard as there's no direct access to community green space um, from their units. The total square footage of each of these 18 two story units is approximately 1200 square feet. And a key feature um, is that they have widened hallways to accommodate people with mobility issues and, and require for any additional room that they may need. Um, our target group for this market would be seniors or couples looking to downsize from single attached homes um, living elsewhere in the community. The first, uh, the first floor of the townhouses is identical to the row houses uh, with the exception of a privately fenced in backyard. And then the second floor is the same, sorry, same uh, square footage as the first, and it contains all three bedrooms uh, and a master bedroom that has an ensuite, uh, and then two mirrored bedrooms at the back, as well as a full size bathroom, laundry, and storage. Okay, uh, the final housing element within the residential development piece of the site is the apartment complex. This four story 64 unit complex offers two different styled units of market housing, one with 900 square feet and the other with 950 square feet. Uh, all units will include a private balcony overlooking the sites in uh, various directions. Uh, there, there is the option of one of the 16 two bed one bath units or one of the 48 one bed one bath units, uh, which are all fully accessible from the ground with an elevator. There is resident parking located east of the structure with visitor options available. Uh, and the building offers basic amenities such as laundry, mail room, and individual secure lockups for residents' valuables. The housing's target market would probably be young professionals or seniors who may only require a small space and want a low maintenance property. Uh, so this template here, uh, this is the one bedroom units uh, that are approximately 900 square feet. Um, that total square footage includes the outdoor balcony as well. Um, and it offers a kitchen, dining space, and living area. Uh, the two bedroom units are a little larger. Um, so yeah, 950 square feet. Uh, they offer a larger kitchen, a smaller dining space, um, but again, a living space, bathroom, and of course the outdoor balcony. Uh, we've also included a gathering space among the three row house uh, developments to offer a tranquil communal green space. Uh, the space will incorporate uh, shared greenery and provide an opportunity for social gathering. And with the addition of benches, the area will create an inviting space for all residents to use. Uh, Quinell's climate data indicates that the uh, fall and winter months are predicted to see participation increase of 10% or almost 10% in the fall and then 6.7% in the winter months. Uh, we have concluded a sufficient amount, included a sufficient amount of green space in our design uh, that has the capacity to absorb rainwater runoff for all uh, year. The green space in infrastructure we've incorporated within our site includes absorbent gardens, a bioswale to help guide stormwater, green infrastructure, uh, that would be adequate for uh, areas with like, you know, sorry, that would be uh, for areas with inadequate drainage. 
The main benefit of green infrastructure is that it uses natural hydrological processes and natural elements such as soil and plants to turn, uh, turn excess water into a site resource. Uh, the bioswale uh, are channels designed to concentrate and convey stormwater runoff while filtering pollutants and debris. They are beneficial in absorbing surface water as they are made with rocks and greenery to, uh, to relay stormwater. The bioswale acts as an aesthetically pleasing water feature. However, it is, its primary purpose is a functioning asset uh, to the site and attempts to introduce ecosystem services within the area. The intention of a central location of the bioswell is to drain excess water from the paved areas of the development away um, from the structure into a, a natural feature that would filter and clean water before it's reabsorbed into the ground. Okay, um, so the introduction of a community center to the site allows day users a safe place from the elements while taking in recreational facilities on site. This year round accessible feature is excellent for community events within the neighborhood and offers a spill out area for outdoor gatherings. Um, from our preliminary presentation, we originally had a community pavilion um, that has now grown into the community center you see in front of you here, uh, but we still wanted to maintain that kind of outdoor sense of the feature and that's that spill out pad on the side. Um, from the previous presentation, the idea of a small coffee shop uh, on site came out. A commercial element to the site could prove beneficial to residents as it would reduce the need for travel. There would be room to incorporate this within the community center. Uh, however, we thought implementing pop-up vendors uh, such as food trucks or markets would provide better service for the site's commercial element rather than having a, uh, one permanent shop on site. Uh, our primary intention of the design for the recreational facilities on site was to maintain some current usage and re-implement tennis courts to encourage the physical activity. Uh, the tennis courts are accessible year round as they will turn into an ice rink for the residents in the winter months. Uh, and a new children's playground helps fill the need for some play space within the neighborhood while creating a, an entire valuable site for people of all ages. Uh, the addition of on-site public parking on the recreation side uh, will help limit the amount of on-street parking that will obstruct traffic movement in peak period times. Uh, and finally, the last piece of the recreation section um, is the baseball diamond. Uh, as mentioned before, this full-size baseball diamond is reincorporated on site to encourage children or ball teams um, or just people alike to come and uh, experience the site. And so with that, uh, that concludes our design presentation. Um, all of us, from all of us here, uh, we would like to thank everyone for taking time out of their day to participate in our virtual presentation. Um, and again, we would like to extend a thank you to the City of Quinell for presenting this opportunity to us. Uh, we hope that our final design captures the elements that the city was looking for within the Caribou, Caribou Field site uh, and just kind of provides a snapshot of what the potential development for the site could look like. Um, so with that being said, uh, we'd like to open the floor up to questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, so can we have uh, the presentation taken down? Otherwise, I won't be able to see council members. Uh, council members, you can also use the chat function just because there's so many people on the screen. And I'll monitor that. But please do. You'll see a blue highlighted everyone to everyone. If you click that, you'll see that you can speak uh, to me or give me a heads up uh, that, uh, that you wanted to uh, get in or ask a question. Or you can also uh, put your hand up if you know how to do that. So, uh, so again, thank you very much. I know from standing in uh, on the preliminary presentation uh, and for Council's uh, reminder, Councillor Rudenberg and Councillor Vic uh, were involved uh, in the process. Uh, I was able to stand in an eavesdrop uh, on one part of it, and you've obviously reflected that conversation uh, and that feedback into your presentation. So, Council, the floor is open. Uh, what uh, is on your mind? Councillor Paul. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, well done, you guys. That is... Um, very well done um, and uh, actually border, bordering on exciting. Um, I like, I'll, I'm liking what I'm seeing. 
a, a couple of questions, and I, I maybe missed this, but do you envisage uh, these units to be rented or owned? Uh, I can field that one. Uh, we envision ownership, um, just yeah, uh, ownership market housing for, for all of them, the row houses, townhouses and apartment. So the, so the entire um, project would be based on a strata type of a principle. Correct. Yes. Okay. Including, including the recreation center, would that be sort of part of the, of the whole development? And in other words, it wouldn't be owned by the city. Oh, refer, referring to the community center, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that one, um, well, I mean, there was a couple different avenues. Uh, we had, we did originally think um, being run by the uh, municipality. Uh, I mean, however, having a community organization come in and, and kind of fill the administrative and kind of upkeep duties of, of the building is probably more ideal, uh, considering it's a little bit more nestled within the, the neighborhood rather than kind of available. I mean, it is available to all residents of the community, but it's not like in a central downtown location. Okay, good. Um, I have a bit of a technical question that, and it has to do with um, the pitched roofs on the, on the units. I see no space for uh, snow to, um, I don't know where the snow snow is going to go. And I'm wondering how important is it to have Paul, Councilor Paul, if I could, we have to really be conscious of the nature of the dialogue we're involved in here. These are not units proposed for building. Uh, this is a concept uh, design. So okay. if, if somebody was interested in that concept, and wanted to do something like this, then absolutely they would be looking at all of the other real factors of, of really building. Uh, what we're trying to do is map out, you know, how much densification, like how many units could you get in there? The kind of variety that the students have put in there, the mix of use between the recreation and so on. So I think your comment about that you know, rec facility, that building that they've created about whether that would be part of Strata or us, you know, the students are recommending we would consider it as a community asset. Uh, so if we did move down this path, then those are the kinds of dialogues we would have. But we don't want to get into the weeds of pictures of roofs and all of that stuff because that's not what the students are actually doing. Okay, uh, point well taken. And and my final question. Um, and I don't know if uh, if the students have thought about this, but I can see uh, the opportunity for uh, for geothermal uh, heat generation because there is so so much green space, particularly the um, the baseball diamond. But that can come at another time. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean that was part of our ecosystem services analysis. Um, M Melissa, did you want to take take on a little bit of that one? Um, I think I think there's lots of opportunities to implement different types of ecosystem services within the area. Um, we hadn't looked at that one in particular. We more focused on like a, a bioswale just for uh, stormwater runoff, um, just because the site is within like a, a flood zone. And also we have incorporated a lot more paved area, so we don't want um, any kind of stormwater to uh, affect our buildings. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Councillor Paul, the other thing is, I know you're keenly interested. Uh, there is no deposit being taken uh, at this point. <laughs> so we're clear too. Uh, so uh, the units are not yet available. Uh, so anyway, thanks, Ron. Uh, Thank other you. questions, uh, council members? Councillor Runch, and then I've got Councillor Elliott. Thank you. Oh, darn it. I thought I could get a deposit in there from you, too. Uh, anyway, a uh, fabulous presentation. Uh, uh, really exciting, actually. I, I really enjoy this. I have a couple questions, two questions, actually, I think that right now jump to the front. One is uh, just, uh, just uh, the clarification for your engagement. You, you did mention uh, two people that you spoke to. Uh, did we also get engagement from the Indigenous community? Um, I can field that question. Um, we did not. Um, we had some pretty big plans with our public engagement, but it just kind of fell short. Um, 
yeah, I mean, significant input would have been awesome from them, but it just, it just didn't happen. Um, there's a few players that can come into blame. I mean, COVID and the fact that we only have one semester to do this, but definitely something we were thinking about, but just didn't um, come to volition and we just didn't get to uh, have those conversations, unfortunately. Yeah. I, okay. So that's, that's not a problem at all. I was just, uh, the other question was like, so you mentioned two engagements, like how, how many people did we actually uh, were engaged? I mean, the project is fabulous. And I, I, and I think we pulled from a lot of different places, but I'm just wondering how many local people actually uh, did you speak to? It was, it was just the two. Um, we did get a chance to get out there um, and uh, speak with uh, Tanya. Um, but uh, in terms of our, our raw public engagement, it was just really the two people and, um, yeah, that, I think that that was probably one of the shortcomings of the pres, of the project. But uh, yeah, no, no, thank you. That's like like I say, I don't. But if the project looks fabulous, so I don't want to belittle this at all. And the, my other question is, and this is just uh, because I don't know enough about it. The bioswale, how deep are those? Um, I'm going to let Melissa take this one. Um, I believe they're only around like a meter or two deep. So it really just depends on like how big of a bioswale you'd want to um, create. Uh, there's also lots of different forms. Ours is more of a more like a pond, um, but most of the time bioswales just run along the side, uh, so they can range from like 20 meters, depending on how big the site is, and then they're usually only a few meters deep. And then they're of course just filled with rocks and vegetation year round. Yeah, I think council. So council runs. Again, um, and just correct me if I'm wrong, Jacob, but I believe, or, or Tanya, uh, this is quite significantly derived uh, from our existing housing strategy and the feedback uh, that you've gotten uh, from the staff who are engaged in that housing strategy. So because of COVID and other things, time sensitivity, it's really a derivative of the consultation and the work uh, that we've been doing. Uh, and then with respect to some of the technical pieces, and I think uh, Melissa, you know, in terms of that swale and so on, or in terms of geothermal, et cetera, that, that building over there, if, if some developer came along and wanted to develop it, you know, Tanya has already worked with us to advance some of our market development desires and requirements and the work that Kyle's doing on the climate change uh, piece. Uh, I think it's a, a very exciting time to get into that kind of stuff. And if anybody's been down in Victoria at that complex that's along the side of the gorge on the Esquimalt side, where they have really developed a, a you know a, a multi-unit complex there uh, that has its own gray water system, it has a geothermal system, has a lot of system something that's got this level of densification, I think would be really interesting for an innovator to come in and do quite a variety of those new systems. So, okay. You good, Martin? Yeah, yeah, th thank you. I, and my only other point is, I might've gone pickleball versus tennis, but otherwise it was a fabulous presentation. Thank you. And, and, and quite frankly, I think it would probably end up pickleball, not tennis, whether <laughs> you liked it or not. So, especially, <laughs> Because in my mind, where I go to, and Mitch may already be there, but that complex would be a brilliant complex for, our, you know, new North Caribou Seniors Council to be managing and running. And I can bet you bottom dollar, they'd be coming at us right away saying, wow, wouldn't that be a great pickleball complex? Uh, the combination of those two things. I see uh, Mitch is nodding like crazy. So I have uh, Councillor Elliott on and then uh, Councillor Vic on. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, great presentation, absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm the chair of the housing committee and first of all, I wanna apologize for not being at the first meeting. I was extremely busy and so uh, kudos and thanks to Councillor Rudenberg and, and Councillor Vic for stepping up. The presentation's fantastic. Uh, yeah, the uh, how dense it is kind of surprises me um, and all the different options that, that you made available. So. It's really interesting to see. I understand the challenges with uh, with a census uh, only being 2016. We had the housing uh, needs and assessment 
uh, study that we did here. And it was, you know, it's always a challenge, but I think we're moving in the right direction. As far as population, we seem to be uh, growing more and more. Um, I, I get the challenges also that you faced with trying to uh, connect with people and, 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 and get those kind of those questions out. Um, it, it's just where we are right now. Um, loved the different the row houses and the townhouses and all this kind of stuff. And I can, I can see particularly in the townhouses where some are trying to um, downsize maybe the potential of having a couple of different plans in there. You know, I'm not sure everybody would need a, a three bedroom, but uh, just knowing the size of it, it's, it's a great place to start. Uh, the bioswale is a, is a really interesting concept. Um, and I've seen this kind of thing happen in, uh, in, potential floodplains in Arizona and stuff like that, where it gets incorporated. So that's, that's pretty neat. And I think at two meters deep, we could definitely get some fish in there. Um, the comments on the, the pickleball, I'm surprised that it took, you know, more than four minutes for, for that to come up. Uh, the community center, maybe somebody could just, uh, I'm looking at the picture and I wasn't quite sure of what you meant by a, a spillout pad. Uh, do, do the windows open up and maybe somebody can just help to, uh, put that vision in my head. Devin, if you pull it up, I can explain it. Uh, I, I think I've already exited this. this it's okay. I, I've got it in my okay. mind. It's just, yeah. Yeah. So on uh, towards the back of it, um, it does have a uh, overhang patio area that uh, the, the side walls are glassed in and there's the opportunity okay. to enclose the entire thing in the winter. But the idea would be um, you kind of have an in-between space there between the courtyard area and the actual community building, maybe somewhere to, to, to be under shelter of, um, you know, access shade and um, yeah. shelter from uh, p potential rain or anything like that. So um, just due to the angle that we took the picture of in, you, you can't see it, but it okay. is, it is there and it was uh, part of the plan. Yeah, I love that. And it, it's something that uh, we've got in our uh, college university here too, the, the opening of the windows and stuff. So I think that's neat. Like the idea of um, potentially having room for the uh, the food trucks and stuff as compared to a, a permanent thing. I think that would be interesting. And, you know, you could uh, diversify with having different things in there all the time. So a really neat idea. Uh, the baseball field, you know, I'm not personally, I'm not sold on it. Uh, and I get why you did it for sure. It was there. It's a great, it's a great feature for residents. Perhaps we've got a lot of baseball fields in town, whether we need one on the West side, I'm not sure. Or maybe we can, you know, we could look at something else that's going on there. I think that this is put together so well that, um, I think Tanya and, and Anna will be able to uh, shop this to developers. There's a lot of interest coming into Quinnell now. Um, so I think this will really help and uh, give some ideas out there. And I think once the word gets out and maybe people can see this, it's gonna be really exciting for the community too. And the people that have been asking for the ability to downsize or just you know to own for themselves and a number of different options. So once again, thoroughly impressed. Thank you very much for, for all your hard work. And, and I think we'll be, uh, we'll be looking at this further for sure. Thanks, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Vic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, I want to say, guys, you've done an amazing job. Like we were already blown away when you showed us the preliminary uh, uh, schematics. And um, my goodness, I, I really think you've, you've just brought it up another level. Um, regarding the pickleball, I thought we talked about that last time. I do <laughs> recollect that. So absolutely. Pickleball, for sure. Um, jokes aside, um, regarding the revisions, some of the revisions you made from when we saw this in November, I think you've really uh, hit the nail on the head with opting for a more of a community center versus the small pavilion concept. Um, the level of densification you've achieved on this parcel, I think will necessitate a little bit more of, the, of, a, of a larger amenity in, the, in a community center. Um, and on that note, um, having a, a a method where uh, vendors can come in, food trucks, et cetera. I think that's also very wise. I would just uh, uh, suggest, or maybe I missed it on your plan there. Um, make sure if, there, if there's a pad where they set up that there should be services. I don't remember seeing that on your, your conceptual design. 
there, it's really important to, for food vendors to have access to basic services, electrical and uh, some fresh water. But anyway, um, and then the, uh, I guess the last thing I'll mention, um, the townhouse uh, looks a little different, this rendition. Um, and I really think that's excellent. Another, another option, as Councillor Elliott and others have mentioned, it's just options for people as they downsize. Um, the question I have out of all of this is, on the, on the townhouse um, concept, um, there are two levels you've indicated. Uh, is there any, uh, in the spirit of accessibility for seniors who may have difficulty with stairs, is there some kind of modification you could propose within the concept to address that issue? And, that, and then I'm gonna mute myself, thank you. Yeah, I, I can field that one. Um, so, I mean, yeah, w the one thing we found too when we were moving the townhouses from the conceptual design to the final rendition um, was space, right? They're on the one portion, they're kind of the Northwestern um, by the entrance where the first townhouse development was. Uh, we actually were able to fit more into the final rendition than on our conceptual design. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's no reason to not say that, uh, I mean, if you just wanted to have a one level and have it a little bit longer or, or take up, you know, kind of one and a half spaces of, of what a, a townhouse is in our design, um, totally doable. There was a, a lot more room on that side. And even in the back with the row of townhouses kind of on the alleyway, same thing. It's just there, I think we added three or four more on that side. Um, than what we had anticipated. So there's definitely room to, to make adjustments with the floor plans with that to, to accommodate people who maybe um, wouldn't like stairs or, or, or can't manage as easily with stairs. Okay, I have a uh, Councillor Rudenberg. Thank you. And it's good to see you guys again. And I echo the sentiments that have been said already. Um, it's really, uh, quite interesting to see how even from just you know what not even a month ago how it's morphed into this this product so um just a, a few comments um if i might um uh counselor elliot was talking about uh the pond i'm sure we have some goldfish that could go in there just saying. <laughs> <laughs> we, we might be able to scoop from some from dragon lake um I like the fact that you've made amenities for all ages in your concept, that you're not just thinking about older people or you're not just thinking about children, that you've got amenities there that set up, that could be set up for every demographic that can move in there. And that it's community based. So you have that outdoor section. So whether it's a baseball diamond or whatever that might be, you have the opportunity, you know, like if this is a, a privately owned community center, you know, what better way to help pay for it than by selling, you know, memberships, etc. So it becomes much more of a community based place other than just those who live there. Um, when you think about the influx of several hundred new people into a, an area like that, when you talk about the, um, whether it was a, a coffee shop or a food truck, I think we kind of talked about this a little bit, the fact that there are a lot of empty spaces in, in West Quinnell where, you know, entrepreneurs will see the, the, the type, you know, the, the families and the, the you know, the um, young executives, whomever moving into that space, they're going to decide what, what they could offer these people in some of those empty spaces. So I think by just having food trucks, that allows other entrepreneurs opportunities to create spaces for them to whether they eat or shop at. Um, and I like the fact too, that you guys recognize that the housing piece in Quenelle, it's not just about the needs of low income housing, that it, it's, it scans the whole scope of housing that's needed. And I mean, Councillor Elliott's uh, housing, um, piece that he's done has recognized that it's more than just low income housing and assisted living it it's it's everyone from young families to seniors who aren't ready to go into assistant living to you know young um young business people so when you look at the type of housing that you've um, suggested there that covers off a lot of that scope and i think that it, that you know when you start when you start changing a neighborhood like that 
it creates a real interesting sense in the rest of the neighborhood. And I mean, you've all heard the stories of West Quinnell and some of the issues that have been over there. But when you start adding these kinds of projects there, it's amazing what happens to a community. Um, so thank you very much for this. You guys did an outstanding job. And I I would be really interested in seeing how this moves forward if we ever get you know, a couple of people who are really interested in building something like this. This would be just absolutely phenomenal. So thanks again, you guys. Thank you, Councillor Rudenberg. And I don't have anybody else on my speakers list. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, Councillor Elliott. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, just, just quickly on the demographics, I find this kind of interesting. You've got the population at 1,450. How, how many blocks back did you go on that? Or is that immediately um, around that area? Uh, it was based on the two dissemination areas. Um, they, they split along the uh, Rodis Street. Um, and we, we basically combined the populations between the two of them uh, to create our rough walkable zone. Um, okay. To answer your question of um, specific blocks, um, I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. But uh, it's not yeah. that important, Jacob. I, I did, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I, I just thought it was oh, interesting. It's yeah. And, and also um, that the homes, I mean, it would be it would be fascinating to see something new there. Right. Uh, from 65 to, to 1980 was the last build. So I think the the whole mm -hmm. community, that whole area would really uh, benefit from from that kind of development. But thank you yeah, very sure. much once again. Yeah, cheers. Great. Mr. Mayor, if I could make a comment here. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so this is the city manager and really impressed with the presentation. I thought it was great. You missed the one spot where all developers come to the city and say, we think you guys require too much parking. And in this case, looking <laughs> at that development, I think there's too much parking in that development. And, and usually we would, from the city side, take the opposite tack. But given that you've got so much housing in one spot, I think you could save some fairly significant dollars, maybe in creating parking reserves where if you need land for parking in the future, you could say, we'll put it there, but without actually developing that parking. And I think we will find as we're given the location of that close to amenities, it's very walkable, and there'll be a, probably a fairly high proportion of seniors. I think we'll find that the, the parking demands are maybe half of what we have planned there. And I realize you use the city requirement numbers. I, I get that, but again, you know, things change. And I think that's one of the areas where perhaps our requirements are a little excessive these days. Thank you. Uh, somebody should uh, note that, minute it, uh, and <laughs> let all the developers in the universe know. Uh, I said I, perhaps, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> I'm going to tie the hands of council who are the ultimate uh, authority on that matter. Anyway, uh, joking aside, I, I, I just ditto uh, to the kudos that you've been given. Uh, I think what you've demonstrated, because we've talked about that property for quite some time, uh, and, and you're always kind of curious in the back of your mind of what's possible. Uh, and so, you know, you don't have all the details. This is not construction ready. You know, be lots of logistics and other things to work out. But you've given us a sense of what's possible on a space like that. Uh, for us, I was just actually talking uh, to some folks uh, in the Ministry of Rural Development, uh, you know, our, our new seniors data set that we've got suggests that we have a lot of seniors who are basically stranded in single family residential situations that are becoming untenable. They have equity, uh, so they're in an equity position. That equity position is growing, but we don't have the ability to get them out of there uh, because we don't have a place for them to go. Uh, so this gives us a sense of, you know, how could you design a space where we could actually address that particular issue, because then we would be freeing up our single family residential stock uh, for others who, you know, COVID refugees, some of the new folks moving in with families who want a yard and so on. So any kind of market multi-unit development we can get right now 
uh, really starts a domino effect of shifting people around that is highly beneficial to us. And as Councillor Rudenberg pointed out, a development of this nature in that particular area begins to really uh, change the tone and the feel and the flavor uh, of that area pretty significantly. Uh, so I think from Council's perspective, uh, Tanya, I wonder if you could just let Council know that we're, we're probably going to be coming back with a supplemental for our neighborhood plan. And uh, Tanya, I wonder if you could just speak to that so Council ties the two together. Uh, yes, thanks, um, uh, Mayor. So yes, this is, uh, this is going to be uh, nicely um, preceding a uh, request to Council for some neighborhood planning in this area. So this is to whet the appetite of council and the community um, for uh, looking at and consulting with the broader community and the neighborhood in specifically in terms of what kinds of developments are going to be um, integrated in there. And I think, uh, I think this plan from you students is, uh, is excellent. I think that you guys, um, um, with the limitations you guys had with respect to COVID and et cetera, uh, you listened to the individuals that you were able to talk to and uh, uh, you know, really listen to us saying housing is such a need here. Look at our uh, housing needs uh, assessment and uh, you know, see what you can do for us. And you, you provided some housing, that's for sure. So uh, hopefully that's going to be a really good start, whet the appetite of other individuals uh, as well as the city. Love your assessment of the neighborhood. Yeah, if you're gonna have this, you guys also need to look and do some reinvestment into, into some of your accessibility to make sure some of these uh, individuals are able to access those great uh, commercial areas uh, to, um, in, in the area. So good job guys. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. So, and again, from council's perspective, that little playground that they've got in there, if we were developing it, we've, we've talked about the possibility of another one of our premium playgrounds being down on that bench, that would be a perfect place uh, to put it. And I think as we develop the neighborhood strategy, we need to really ask ourselves uh, the question that we've been asking ourselves about enticing developers to come. And that is what role uh, over and above the DCC relief and the tax relief we're playing, what role can we play to make something like this possible? And that goes to you know, Council Paul's questions and others about that recreation component to it and, you know, community space component to it. But I would add that we need to take a look at it through the lens of active transportation to the city manager's point, because there is a way to tie the bottom end, the Fraser River end of that uh, field into uh, the Baker Creek uh, walking area to allow people to walk back up through Baker Creek and have a nice nature walk but also to tie them in with an, another potential pedestrian bridge over Baker Creek straight into West Park Mall, right under our riverfront trail so that they can easily get into town. So I think that's the kind of thinking we need to do that if we can entice a developer to come in with a concept of this kind, what is the role that we will play to put the whole package together and make it a truly modern you know, climate uh, change uh, friendly, active transportation friendly living space that starts to catalyze the changes that we would hope uh, to see over there, plus address a lot of our needs. So you've given us lots uh, to you know, be able to wrap our heads around, uh, lots of fodder for going out on this neighborhood plan, should council approve that. And I think uh, quite frankly, I think it would be exciting uh, for folks to see this kind of thinking coming into our community. So. Again, I don't have anybody else. So I wonder if somebody from UMBC wants to close off uh, tonight's uh, discussion. Yeah, I can uh, maybe uh, take on uh, that role. I'll uh, ask uh, the students maybe have the final word in terms of some uh, thanks to mayor and council for uh, joining us today. Um, and, you know, I don't have any uh, additional comments. Uh, I think uh, you guys spoke uh, so exceptionally well to uh, what the students worked on. And uh, it's so exciting to see uh, really, really kind of visionary thinking uh, happening within our uh, northern communities. You know, I think the secret that we don't tell everyone in the rest of Canada is that the north is the best place to live. And uh, it's exceptional to, uh, to see really bold futures uh, coming out of some of our communities. And uh, we're 
exceedingly grateful to uh, be invited in in a small way into part of that process through this type of a partnership. So just my gratitude again for uh, allowing us to partner in this type of a learning opportunity. And uh, I'll maybe just pass it over to uh, the group just to say a final thanks. I would just like to say thank you for everyone that was able to listen to our presentation today. Uh, we put many hours into this and it's really great hearing all the feedback that you've given us, um, as well as the questions you've proposed have made us think a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, but thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I echo a lot of what Melissa said. Um, there were a lot of long nights, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, even longer days. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was, it was a fun project to be able to kind of, especially as a, as a fourth year planning student, be able to take everything I've learned thus far, kind of combine it into one, tie a bow on it, and uh, and really, you know, showcase kind of what me personally, what I've learned in the last four years. So it was a great opportunity um, to especially work with the team here. We had a great team um, and be able to do something like this. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you a lot to the city of Quinnell and, and to our instructor, Mark, as well. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. And that wasn't for bonus points, right? That was just- <laughs> Well, the grades are already in. Oh, okay, great. Oh, man. <laughs>